Welcome to this video where we are looking at comparing Spring Boot versus Spring. I have heard this question asked a number of times. What is Spring? What is Spring Boot? How do they compare against each other? Actually, in my, in my view, there is no comparison between Spring and Spring Boot. They solve their own problems. They have their own goddamn space. So, yeah, the comparison does not really matter because Spring solves its own problem of dependency injection and Spring Boot solves the problem of uh, getting applications live quickly. So they have their own problem spaces, but we in this video, we'll look at it in depth. So we'll look at the problems, we would look at their goals, and we would finally realize that each one of them have their own space. There's not really any competition that is brewing between Spring and Spring Boot. Spring and Spring Boot are not competing options. So let's get started. I'm going to my website, springboottutorial.com, where there's a beautiful article on Spring Boot versus Spring MVC versus Spring. How do they compare? So that's what we are looking at right now. If you're new to Spring or Spring Boot, and if you want to get started with something, then you can actually go there and uh, have a lot of references to courses which would be really useful for you. But if you are experienced, then let's get to the core of the problem. So what's the core problem that Spring Framework solves? The most important problem that Spring Framework solves is called testability. Just go a decade back. I mean, I have more than 15 years of experience developing applications. And 15 years back, we don't unit test applications at all. So I, like, I don't write unit tests at all. What is the reason? Because the frameworks which are there at that point in time did not support testability. That's the kind of world that the Spring Framework came in. Spring Framework came with this concept called dependency injection. So that's kind of the core innovation of control or dependency injection is the core of how things work. So if I'm not using dependency injection, this is how I do things. Welcome service, service is equal to welcome service. I create my own instances. So what would happen is this welcome controller is directly tied to the welcome service. This cannot be unit tested at all, or it would be very difficult to unit test. You have to do reflection or things like that to populate this with kind of a mock. If creating a new welcome service is a problem, how does dependency injection solve it? That's basically what we are looking at. So this welcome service is used by welcome controller. So welcome service is called a dependency of the welcome controller. When we are using dependency injection, what we would do is we will let the framework do all the hard work. We'll let the spring framework do the hard work. So we'll use two simple annotations, at a component and at auto wired. So what is at component? With at component, we the welcome service is telling Spring Framework, hey, Spring Framework, this is a bean that you need to manage. So the welcome controller uses something called at auto wired. So welcome controller says, hey, Spring Framework, I want a welcome service, find it and give it to me. So that's basically what is called auto wiring. So what Spring Framework does is at, as soon as it sees an add component, it creates a component for welcome service. And it sees that the welcome controller needs the welcome service. So there is a matching algorithm to find out whether it's the same class, whether there's an implementation of interface, whether it has the same bean name, a lot of logic around it. But eventually what it does is it finds the bean and auto wires it in here. Thereby, the advantage that we would get is if I want to mock this, I can populate this myself. So the, with the advancements in the mocking and mockito stuff, right now it's very easy to replace this service with a mock. That's basically the functionality that Spring brings in. The problem that Spring solved was dependency injection. That was the main problem. I mean, the fact that the applications were not testable, that's the core problem which Spring attacked and it produced the solution of dependency injection or inversion of control. The inversion of control is because Welcome controller, is it creating an instance of the dependency? No. Who is controlling it? Spring framework is controlling it. So that's why it's called inversion of control. Inversion of control is control becomes opposite. Instead of the class taking control, so the, he, this is an example of the class welcome controller taking control because it's saying, okay, I need a new welcome service. Okay, here it's saying, okay, I don't want to control it. So I need a instance of welcome service. Uh, Spring Framework, you create it however you want to create it and give it to me. I don't want to take the responsibility of creating the welcome service. So that's the problem of dependency injection. So is that the only problem Spring Framework solves? No, nope. there are other problems too. 
The other problems are duplication and plumbing code. So if you look at Spring modules like Spring JDBC, Spring JMS, like if you looked at JDBC code of the old, you would see that I, just to do a small insert statement, I had to write like 25, 30 lines of code. And with Spring JDBC, you can do that in three, four lines of code. I mean, we have now moved on to ORMs, Hibernate, and things like that. But still, Spring JDBC is a good abstraction on top of JDBC. So if I would, don't want to use JDBC and I don't, I'm not comfortable going to an ORM framework, Spring JDBC still provides a good abstraction on top of it. So these frameworks like Spring JDBC, Spring JMS, this actually tried to eliminate duplication. So you had duplicate exception handling, duplicate creation of prepared statements and all that kind of stuff. So that's the problem that Spring prob Framework tried to solve as well, duplication and plumbing code. The other thing that Spring Framework uh, solved was good integration with other frameworks. So uh, there are a lot of other frameworks which are solving problems very well. For example, Hibernate is a good ORM framework. IBAT is for object mapping to a database table. And also there were good unit test frameworks, mocking frameworks and things like that. So Spring did not try to solve those problems. Spring just provided good integration with them. Look at 10 years back, the problems that Spring Framework was trying to solve is to make applications testable, to reduce duplication. And the third problem it was trying to solve is have good integration with other frameworks. And that's why it became very popular over the last 10 years, more I think more than 90% of the applications use Spring because it solved the problems that we had at that point in time. What's the need for Spring Boot? If Spring was solving all the problems, what is the need for Spring Boot at all? The reason why we need Spring Boot is we are changing. So now we are shifting towards application, uh, like we are shifting towards microservices. And with microservices, one of the most important aims is that we would want to be able to develop applications very quickly. So instead of building one large application, we would want to build 10 small microservices which have their own scope, which have their own capabilities. One of the things that you would see is Spring-based applications have a lot of configuration. I'm not just talking about XML configuration here. It can be Java configuration as well, using annotations or things like that. But typically, we would have a lot of configuration which is present. For example, if I want to use Spring MVC, I would need to use a component scan, I would need to configure dispatcher servlet, view resolver, web jars, among other things. So these are of extract from our course on Spring MVCs. You can see that I had to configure a view resolver, a lot of XML around it, web jars, and then I had to go to my web.xml, configure a dispatcher servlet, configure the URL to it. For example, if I'm using a JPA, like if I'm connecting a Spring Framework to JPA, then I would need to configure a data source, I would need to initialize the database, I would need to configure an entity manager factory, a transaction manager, and all these kind of things. So if you look at 15 applications, probably 14 of them would have the same configuration repeated again and again. So the same configuration which is in here, you would find it repeated in almost all applications which are there. And this kind of configuration makes it slow to develop applications. So that's kind of the place where Spring Boot auto configuration comes in and it says, can we think different? So when somebody wants to use Spring MVC, I know he, he wants to use dispatcher servlet as well. Would somebody bring in Spring MVC without wanting to use a dispatcher servlet? Why don't I auto configure it for him? Would somebody bring in a static, static jar without meaning to use a web jar? Nope. I'll configure web jars for him. That's where Spring Boot comes in with this concept called auto configuration. It says, can we bring more intelligence into this? When a Spring MVC jar is added into an application, can we do auto configuration automatically? How about configuring our data source automatically if a Hibernate jar is on the class path? And same with dispatcher servlet if Spring MVC is added into the class path. So what Spring Boot does is this with this concept of auto configuration, it looks at what frameworks are available at the class part and it looks at what configuration is provided by the programmer or like what pro configuration is provided already for the application. It looks at both of them and it says, okay, data source is not configured, but there is hibernate on the class part. So I'll configure a data source automatically. I don't see a database in here. So I'll configure an in-memory database. I don't see a dispatcher servlet configured. So I'll configure a dispatcher servlet. This is called auto configuration. This is a very important concept in Spring Boot. And second problem uh, that Spring Boot tries to solve is with Spring Boot startup projects. So this is an extract 
uh, of the dependencies which I had to get uh, to build a very simple uh, Spring MVC application. So I had to add in four or five dependencies and I have to manage the versions. I had to find out that Jackson data bind, I had to use 2.5.3 and not 1. something because this 2.5.3 is the one which works with 4.2.2. release. And I want to use a specific version of Hibernate Validator because this is the one which is compatible with Bean Validation latest API. So I had to make all these decisions, make the choice and make the frameworks available in here. So Spring uh, kinds of Spring Boot says, okay, if these are the choices which programmers are making, why don't I make them for the programmers? Why don't I create a startup project by which I would get all these by default. So Spring Boot comes with this concept called starters. Starters are basically convenient dependency descriptors that you can include in your application. If I want to use a web application, then I have a simple starter for web application. If I want to use JPA, then there is a Spring Boot starter data JPA. I just need to add that in and I'm good to go. So let's consider an example, right? Spring Boot starter web is one of the things which we uh, which is one of the famous starters. So Spring Boot Starter Web, this is the dependency. And as soon as I use Spring Boot Starter Web in a project, I'll get all these dependencies directly. So I'll get Spring Boot related stuff, the auto configuration stuff, the logging, and also you'd get the Tomcat, embedded Tomcat. So by default, Spring Boot Starter Web brings in embedded Tomcat, and then it brings the validation stuff, binding, and all the core Spring functionality. So these are what are used in typical web applications or RESTful web services. So Spring, as soon as you add in Spring Boot Starter Web, I don't really need to worry about, okay, which version of validation API to use. So as soon as I use a specific version of Spring Boot Starter Web, then I would get all the latest versions which are possibly working well together, so which are compatible with each other. All of them are given to me by default. So that's the second problem that Spring MVC is trying to solve. So when I try to develop an application, web application, I don't need to go and search, I want Spring MVC, I want binding, so I need this, I want validation, so I need this, I want web jar, so I need this configuration. I don't need to worry about all that. So I include Spring Boot Starter Web and it includes all the dependencies that are needed to run a project for that. So if you look at the classification, then it's basically the Spring Web MVC framework, Jackson for data binding, validation, embedded servlet container, that is Tomcat, uh, Spring Boot also supports Jetty and Undertow as well. And you have logging, log for log back, SLF for J is the default, but you can override it with log for J too. Um, so these are the various options that Spring Boot Starter provides. So Spring Boot has a lot of starters, like we looked at the Spring Boot Starter Web, but you have Starter for Web Services, which is to develop SOAP Web Services. Oops, there's a SOAP Web Service Starter as well, that's cool. And you have a test for writing unit tests and integration tests, JDBC for developing a JDBC application, HateOS to add uh, HateOS links to your services. You have security, Spring Boot Starter security, Spring Security is a quite popular framework. So that's kind of the starter built around that. It provides authentication and authorization. Data JPA, cache, data rest. You can look up our channel and you would find uh, tutorials for most of these starters. Does Spring Boot stop with that? No, there are, there are other goals for Spring Boot as well. Spring Boot Starter Actuator, it provides advanced features like monitoring and tracing your application in production. So when I deploy something in production, I want to make sure that it's live, it's running. It's not down. So how do I do that? I can do that using something called Spring Boot Starter Actuator. And also it provides integration with logging and stuff. And one of the other important features of Spring Boot is embedded server integration. So these are all the different things that Spring Boot provides. So what we looked at in this video is the evolution from Spring to Spring Boot. Spring and Spring Boot are not competitors to each other. Spring solves the problem of unit testability and duplication inside code. Spring Boot solves the problem of duplication with configuration and making framework choices. Spring Boot says, okay, you want to develop a web application? You just need these three files, you go and start with your application. That's the problem which Spring Boot solves. There you go. Those are the important things that you would need to know about Spring Boot versus Spring Boot. In 28 minutes, our focus is on making you an expert at Spring Boot.
We have created a complete website on Spring Boot at www.springbootshutorial.com. The link in the description of video would take you to a page where you find details of all the courses, videos and the articles we have created on Spring Boot. If you love our videos, you would love our courses too. Our courses have great reviews on Udemy. You can see some of the reviews in here. And there are also articles on basics of Spring Boot, auto configuration, startup projects, startup pairing, less services, web application, all the code examples. We have Maven projects which are present which you can directly import into Eclipse and start running them and other references as well. This page would be a great start for you to become an expert on Spring Boot. You might also want to visit our website www.in28minutes.com all other courses other than Spring Boot as well. Thank you for all the support you are providing us. We would not have grown to 52,000 on Udemy. We would not have such great reviews on courses on Udemy without your support. We would not have been able to grow to 28,000 subscribers and more than 3 million views without your support. We want you to learn and make best use of all the courses that we have. Good luck and I will see you in the next video of the course. Until next time, here's Ranga from In28Minutes signing off.